Good evening. I'm James Roth, Deputy Director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of my colleague Stephen Rothstein, Executive Director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, and all of my library and foundation colleagues, thank you for coming this evening. I also want to acknowledge <clears throat> the generous support of our underwriters at the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsor, Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. I'm also delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening, and when Q&A starts, we will invite those of you who are joining us in person tonight to proceed to the microphones in the aisles to ask your questions. There's one right here and one right here. James and Deborah Fallows have agree kindly agreed to sign books after tonight's forums, and our bookstore has copies of tonight's books available for purchase if you are interested. Now, before we begin tonight, I want to acknowledge that today is a very special day for us at the library, as it marks the 101st anniversary of John F. Kennedy's birth. Thank you for all being here with us as we celebrate this day, so yes. We had cake earlier, but uh, unfortunately it's all gone, so I apologize. In this evening's conversation, we have an opportunity to shine a light on major change happening now across the country that rarely receives coverage on national news. From economic dislocation to the opioid crisis, Americans across this country in their local communities are responding to these challenges. Chronicling these changes, tonight's speakers have witnessed how local communities have crafted solutions with a practical determination that could usefully inform the national dialogue. I'm delighted to introduce the participants in tonight's discussion. It is a pleasure to welcome James and Deborah Fallows, authors of Our Towns, A 100,000-Mile Journey into the Heart of America. James Fallows has been a national correspondent for the Atlantic for more than 35 years and is the author of 11 previous books. He has won a National Book Award and a National Magazine Award. For two years, he was President Jimmy Carter's chief speechwriter. <clears throat> Deborah Fallows is a linguist and writer who holds a PhD in theoretical linguistics and is the author of two previous books. She has written for, no <clears throat> excuse me, for numerous national publications and has worked at the Pew Research Center, Oxygen Media, and Georgetown University. I'm also pleased to welcome Hillary Fry, executive editor of HuffPost. Last fall, she led HuffPost's Listen to America bus tour to 25 cities across the U.S. She's a career editor who has previously worked at organizations including The Nation, Salon.com, Fusion, and NBC News. And I'm also delighted to welcome back to the library Ellen Fitzpatrick, professor of history at the University of New Hampshire, to moderate tonight's discussion. A specialist in modern American political and intellectual history, she is the author of eight books. So please join me in welcoming our guests this evening. So not only is it President Kennedy's birthday, it's a beautiful day, and you have come to a setting where you're going to hear something optimistic about our country. So uh, <laughs> uh, these are rare, this is a rare convergence of events and uh, it's really very fascinating to see uh, what our guests here tonight have been up to and what they've been learning about the United States outside of the glare of uh, the Twitter feed of our president and the headlines and the 24-hour cable news cycle. So, uh, and what's so interesting about the projects that they pursued is uh, the enormous divergence in what they found from uh, what you're used to getting as a steady diet these days in our country. Uh, but it also uh, leaves us with the paradox between what they found and what you think, or perhaps, if you think like I do, walking into the room tonight. So I'd like to ask them some questions to try to get at that a little bit, and then we'll have some time for, for all of you to uh, pose your questions. But I think the place to start 
is to ask uh, Jim and Deb to talk about how they came up with this idea and what they actually did, and then Hillary, for you to tell us um, about what you did. Uh, we had two different modes of transportation involved, <laughs> air by air and by bus. Uh, but it was uh, sort of like the Simon and Garfunkel song that they went off to see America. And uh, they found some very interesting things along the way. So tell us a little bit about how you got going. So I'll give a brief intro. First, Deb and I are just so delighted to be here with Hillary and Ellen, with all of you. Thanks to the library. Thanks for all of you for coming out in this beautiful evening. We, we've lived in Boston before, so we know how special this weather is right now. And <laughs> thanks for, thanks for uh, taking the time to come out. The, the brief version of what we decided to do is I've worked for the Atlantic for a very long time. And with Deb, we spent a lot of time outside the US. We've been in Japan and Malaysia and China. And we were living in China before being, beginning this project, mainly spending our times going out to the hinterland by bus and by train, one time riding horses to get away from the big cities. We came back to the US. The prevailing narrative was so dark and dystopian. This was you know, soon after the financial collapse. We thought, what would it be like to do this same kind of approach to, to the US, going to small towns like the ones where each of us grew up. I was from a small town in inland California and Deb from northern Ohio. And we had for a long time seen the country through the means of our single engine propeller plane. And we knew how many places you could get to in the US that way that were hard to reach any other fashion. So the sort of the main beginning of our project was five years ago right now. I put an article on the, my part of the Atlantic site saying, tell us why the story of your town is something we should come see. We are looking for smaller towns, not normally in the media attention. We were looking for towns that had some kind of problem, a factory closing, a drought, you know, a disaster, or whatever it was, and that had some interesting story. And in the week that followed that, we got about 1,000 essays from people from every 49 of the 50 states um, saying, here's why Sioux Falls is the place to come to. Here's why Utica is the place. Here's why um, Worcester, Mass is the place. Here's why, you know, y you name it. And so we just began the journey and did it over the next four years or so, going to about 25 towns at, for several weeks length. Yeah. So just a little bit about how we started. Um, we, we did a little research. We, we looked through all these thousand entries that people wrote to us. We did some. We picked out some ones that looked interesting, or we had a little lead from someone we knew in some in a place in the t in one of the towns, and we'd do some looking around on the internet, like what was their local newspaper like or their town's website, and s to see if it had a sense of energy and so forth, and then we'd kind of throw a dart in the map and decide to go. Um, our the way the work the week usually the week or two weeks or three weeks usually played out was on the first day Jim and I would go together to m meet what we fondly, finally called the usual suspects. We'd find the newspaper editor and the mayor or the city manager, somebody connected with the school system, always the librarian, and say, so tell us what's going on in your town and who are the people we should meet and what are the stories that are, are important to you here. And then we'd fan out in our separate directions starting on day two to, um, to all of these different pursuits. Jim usually went to talk to folks about economic development and the politics of the town. And I went to, to the schools, spent a lot of time in classrooms and to the library and the YMCA's, places like that. And then we went to the brew pubs together and, <laughs> and hung out. Um, and uh, so it would play out during the week. And by the end of the week, it was, we're, we've got to come back. We're never going to finish here. There's so much to talk about. And, and, and the one nugget was that at the end of each day, when we came, would meet up for meet up, when we would come back for, for dinner, the conversation would usually start the same way it did every day we were in China, which was, you're never going to believe what I heard today <laughs> or found today or saw today. So that's, that's how it began. Yeah. Hillary? Um, so HuffPost, um, you probably associate it with Ariana Huffington, but she is not part of HuffPost anymore. She left the company uh, um, about two years ago, 
And about a year and a half ago, um, HuffPost got a new editor-in-chief. Her name is Lydia Polgreen. She came from the New York Times. She's an amazing journalist, um, former foreign correspondent. And fortunately, uh, all, she's also my friend. So <laughs> when she went to HuffPost, um, I had the opportunity to go with her just on a consulting basis to help her get some things under control. And while um, we were sort of getting things set up, we had an opportunity to pitch um, to our parent company, which is called, it, at the time, we're just owned by Verizon. I'll spare you that story. But um, we have a sort of corporate parent, and they were taking pitches from their brands to do a brand-defining project. And this was early 2017. The election was still very, very fresh. Um, and you know, we had just sort of talked, like, how do we get out across the country and really just hear from people? I said, well, why don't we just go out across the country and listen to people? Um, and we wanted to do it in a really grassroots way um, that felt, you know, down home and authentic. So, of course, we had to do a bus. And um, so we sort of got this project going. We knew we wanted to, to take a bus. We had a budget to work with, so we couldn't go everywhere. We had some parameters to work with. But we actually worked with, um, with an agency uh, that's very experienced in political campaign advance work to help us pack in as many cities as possible in the seven weeks' time that we knew we could do. So we came up with a route um, that sort of took us in a loop around the country that was a mix of tips um, from people who we solicited um, from our, our readers as well, but also just places that some of us at HuffPost had heard of that were sounded really amazing that we hadn't been to, like Oxford, Mississippi, which was a place I would love to go back and spend more time. Um, Livingston, Montana, a, a mix of small small cities and mid-sized cities. Um, another one was Fort Wayne, Indiana, where a former colleague of mine was from, and she just couldn't say enough about how amazing Fort Wayne was. And we really had an amazing experience there with their library um, and their community college doing an event. So. We set a course to go out last fall um, over seven weeks, 25 cities, and in each place what we did was, um, we did a lot of planning this time last year, was really when we kicked it off, to find a place to take the bus for about four hours every day where there would be high foot traffic. People could just come by, sit with us, tell us their story. Um, all my journalists who were on the road were trained in active listening, so their prompt was very simple. It was. What brought you down here today? It wasn't a questionnaire. We didn't. We weren't trying to get at politics particularly. It was just tell us what's on your mind. And we allotted for seven minutes per interview, and each one definitely could have gone for a half an hour, I'm sure. Um, and over the seven weeks, we were able to interview about 1,700 people, which far surpassed our expectations. Um, and in addition, when we were in these towns, we did an event that was um, built around a topic of local debate, like school vouchers, or the education system, or affordable housing, um, and also worked with the local, some, some local media outlet um, to do an investigative piece of journalism. So we produced a lot of stories from the road, and just now we're, we're getting ready to release um, a sort of interactive report where you can hear the voices of, you can literally, you'll be able to play them and listen to them, um, the voices of people we met on the road. It's interesting that there's a long tradition, of course, in American letters of uh, what I guess used to be called travel narratives yeah. uh, from uh, de Tocqueville, Crevecourt, uh, to Steinbeck's mm -hmm. Travels with Charlie. Uh, and I was very struck in reading uh, the Fallows book about the perspective that they got from the air. I loved reading uh, much more than I love being in. <laughs> I loved reading about you being in an airplane that was flying at uh, an altitude low enough so that it literally gave you a unique view on these geographical points that you decided to visit. And I wondered if you could speak to that about what it was like, f what you learned flying into these places, and then we'll get to the bus. Yeah. It's a whole other thing. Deb and I have complementary views on this topic of being in the airplane, the sort of left seat versus right seat view. How many people here are pilots? There must be some. How many people would like to be pilots? 
<laughs> How many people are interested in the aerial view? You know, it, it's yes. there. There, I, I mentioned in the book that when flight was first, you know, being invented a, a century ago and was really dangerous, the assumption was that every writer, every intellectual, every painter, every poet would want to become a pilot, just because you have this incredibly revealing and beautiful view from 2,000 feet. It makes you realize when you're driving, you have the view from six feet above ground level. When you're in an airplane, an airliner, you're at 30,000 feet and you can't really see anything. It just, you know, people close the windows and you're too high anyway. Um, but when you're, when you're flying in a small airplane, you can see things about the country that are both just undeniably beautiful the way that the, the, the most of the eastern United States is still forested and how just the tapestry of the landscape as you head west and it gets drier and higher as you're heading towards the Rockies. You can see the Rockies coming from a couple hundred miles away. It, it's not, not simply beautiful, but also um, revealing. You can see things that, that, that people in towns want to have hidden. For example, every town you, you never see quarries when you're driving around, but every town is just ringed with quarries. And, and you see that when you're, that's where all the, the, the road, for, the, the rock for roads comes from. Prisons, you see how many prisons are, are in the U.S. You see the logic of where, where towns are placed relative to the, the mountains and, and the rivers. I'll just give one more left seat um, side of this because I, I have loved flying for a long time because of this view. It's like scuba diving through the air essentially and you can see things. It's as if you're at low level Google Earth but when you're flying along the Appalachians on the eastern front you can see the fall line. You can see that you know the, the rivers coming out of the Appalachians and you can see where all the mill towns were set up 250 years ago and just why things are where they are and, and so that was why I like, I love flying the airplane. I love being able to get from place to place. I love seeing what you see. And then Deb, meanwhile, was sitting in the right seat. So yeah. you've heard the romantic view of the <laughs> flight. Yeah, I, I will just add one thing. When we were in China, of course, we learned some Chinese. And the, uh, the word for America is meiguo, which means beautiful country. And I think I get, that we did truly get a, a new appreciation of that, of Mekwa, why it was named that. And I, I don't know who figured that out in China, but they were right. In, uh, also, as an aside, Germany is called Degwa, which means land of laws, which is <laughs> kind, of, kind of funny. But um, So the view from the right seat, which is my seat, not the pilot seat, is it's different. I think of it as more logistics. Um, and when we're coming into land to a place, Jim doesn't usually see this because he's busy landing, but you get an initial view kind of scoping out what a town looks like if it's, if it's well bordered or if it kind of flows out into other towns. You can get a sense of are there a lot of church spires or not? Are the swimming pools above ground or set in the ground? Are the factories parking lots full of cars or are there no cars and tufts of weeds growing among in the asphalt so you get this initial view that's different from driving in you know the highway from a town where you inevitably see the little malls and mini malls and or the dollar stores mm -hmm. it's a, it is a very different overhead view before landing that that kind of sets the stage and and should we bike around should we try to rent a car or what that's and, and as I say just one, one more thing maybe the biggest surprise of seeing the u.s from this way is you realize how little of it is road when you're driving all you see is road because that's the only place you can go from above you see there's these little tiny roads and then just lots of stuff that's not road which is interesting and you get if you read this book you get to uh see it all from the comfort of your living room <laughs> and your easy chair under a good lamp because the, the descriptions uh, that uh, Jim and Deb provide are, are absolutely wonderful. So I spent a lot of time on the bus when I was a college student before they upgraded them and you know made them modern and fun to ride in. I have not been in one in recent, since they you know, reached this new level. So uh, it seems to me one of the things uh, that the fellows describe is in flying in over these areas is seeing the deindustrialization of the country 
as well, the shuttered factories, the weeds that yeah. Deb referred to. And I wondered whether in coming by bus into uh, the towns and cities you went to, what sort of initial impressions you were getting? I have to say, it's a little hard to answer. Our bus was, um, it was a touring coach, like a rock band. Yes. And most of my poor staff was in a passenger van behind us, <laughs> shoved in four in a row, passed out on top of each other for much yeah. of the driving. And we did a lot of night, night arrivals. I see. So our impressions um, were more, you know, please get us off this bus or this van. <laughs> um, but I will say one of the amazing things about traveling that way, especially when I was, I was on tour for about half of half the time, I came on and off the road. Um, our one staff member who was out the whole time was our photographer who shot all seven weeks. And um, it's really amazing pictures. But we had a professional bus driver, Bobby, who was a, you know, he's a bus driver his whole career um, in his late 60s. And we just talked to Bobby and heard his stories of traveling around the country too. And that, it was like a, I think for us, traveling that way or being packed in a van and sharing stories with each other was just a different aspect of um, the culture of the tour that, just kind of kept um, our momentum going, like staying close to the ground. I mean, we were really, you guys were up here and we were down here, um, but kind of like unloading like a band and, and setting right. up. And it was a little life on the road for us. A little different than pulling into the bus terminal in these, which would have probably given you not quite as romantic a view of the whole thing uh, as the one that uh, you may have otherwise acquired. The, uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how you picked your destinations. You invited people to write in and say, come to our town. But in the end, there was a method to, you had in mind, it seemed to me, uh, pretty clearly what you wanted to get at. And I wondered if you could uh, tell uh, the audience a little bit yeah. about how you did that. It was a combination of happenstance and, and plan. There have been some people who, in, in response to our book, have said, oh, well, this was not a scientific survey. Well, duh. This was, this was re reporting as we were taking opportunities along the way. But I, I think the, the, to say a bit more about the threshold criterion we had and then the way that the selection unfolded, one of our senses from the media is, is a real imbalance in the depth and complexity and sort of human richness with which the media usually portray different parts of the country. So that, that generally, and just for reasons we can understand, things that happen in DC or New York or Boston or LA or San Francisco are, they're portrayed as full human dramas and you have villains and heroes and all that. And the rest of the country is usually portrayed as something, is a place where things happen too. They happen, the people in the Midwest have globalization happen to them or droughts happen to them. And th there are, of course, some big things that happen. But we wanted to find places that generally didn't get portrayed with that same sort of active, full human, human range. And then we wanted to, I guess the, the next, the first place we spent significant time was Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which was interesting to us simply in the how much more was happening there than we had any idea of. And, and I guess the method we involved is we went across the north, you know, in Michigan and then Burlington, Vermont, Eastport, Maine, and then came down the south as it got colder through um, South Carolina and Georgia, then across going over to, to the west coast, was trying to have a, a diversity of regional experiences. And we got to every part of the country except the heart of the Rocky Mountains where we didn't want to fly our plane. We wanted to have a range of sizes. We saw places as small as Eastport, Maine, a couple thousand, Ajo, Arizona, and places as very large as Columbus, Ohio, which is a huge city, but still is seen as a Midwestern city rather than a, a national city. And then increasingly as time went on, we went to places that were more and more troubled uh, to in West Virginia, in northern Mississippi, and then uh, San Bernardino, California, right near where I, I grew up in, in the town of Redlands, and ending up in western Kansas and, and, and Louisville. So I think it was 
initially we were sort of surprised by how well and vibrant things were, and then we sort of systematically started looking for places that had more obvious troubles, troubles to see how they were dealing with it. I just wanted to add on or compliment one thing that Hillary was talking about of the culture of the bus. We also had a little culture of our plane. It was just the two of us, but maybe you don't often think about it when you're on a commercial airline, but we were able to talk to the eight, we had to yes. talk to the air traffic controller, the ATC all the time. So we, we it was noisy and to get the record straight, this was not a luxury, you know, <laughs> e express jet trip. This was a little propeller plane. If it was cold outside, we were cold. If it was hot outside, we were hot. We wore these, it was a, noisy, so you wear these big earmuffs and talk with a little microphone to the air traffic controller. But it's fun and it's interesting because there are always surprising things going on that the controllers are warning you about and we can go into some of the horrific stories later, but, um, and, and when we run out of things to talk to each other about, we can listen to Sirius XM radio and you find these shows like my favorite road dog trucker <laughs> that call in shows from the truckers on the road behind you with their worst load ever stories that are, that are very exciting, you know, about how they survive or, or the soybean prices over Iowa, or, or the cost of corn, or the weather reports, you know, where you're not and things. And so it's, there is a culture in, in small plane flying too that's um, colorful. Yeah. This was all data because uh, Deb is a linguist and uh, she goes into some uh, detail about these conversations with the air traffic controllers and the slang, the accents, yeah. the, uh, you know, how much she observes simply by interacting with these folks. Hillary, when you, uh, one of the things that I learned on the website, that this wonderful website of these Voices of America that uh, the HuffPost has created, that you, one of the prods was the question, of what keeps you up at night? Mm. And uh, it struck me as a wonderful question. There's a great Raj Chast cartoon about what's playing at the Insomniaplex. It shows this movie theater with all these Ebola coming to your neighborhoods, you know, that sort of thing. So it's a great question. We all have worries, some more than others. And I wondered about your construction of that as a way of getting at these diversity of voices. Sure. I think, um, you know, we worked with an expert in active listening when we, when we trained everybody to go out on the road. Because even though it seems like this is an obvious journalistic project, teaching yourself to slow down and not constantly ask the next question is really hard. So we worked, we, we role played, we learned things about each other, practicing this. And while we would sort of open with the prompt of what brought you down today, I have to say it was pretty quickly people were telling us what was keeping them up at night. Once they got over the disbelief that we were simply there to listen, which was shocking to people. Wait, you're here, you're part of a news organization, do you want me to fill something out? What are the five questions are you going to ask me about Trump? Why am I here? You say, no, we want to hear from you about what's on your mind, what's working in your community, what isn't, what's keeping you up. And Really, I mean, I think when, when I'm asked sort of, what was the most surprising thing about being on the bus tour? There are two things. One was that um, Donald Trump almost never came up. And it's not that only, it, we weren't getting just Trump supporters or just HuffPost readers or Democrats or whatever. It was really a broad cross section of people came down to talk to us. But the issues are local. I mean, you write about this a lot. People will mobilize and cross look over differences that are this big to accomplish getting a playground built or a new school or um, you know in the case of Akron Ohio like fixing this decommissioned six-lane highway yeah. that cuts through their city right so you know people were so open and that was the thing that also really mm -hmm. surprised me was if you give give a space to share there's such a hunger to be heard and people are so open. I think people were surprised how open they were, but it, we created a lot of relationships, even on an individual level on this tour, 
um, as a result of following through on the promise of listening. It's interesting that as a digital newspaper that the Huff Post is, was innovative in this way because once upon a time the national newspapers would send somebody out and get those local stories and send them there for a month and the, well, the whole changes in the world of journalism have so altered that mm -hmm. that it requires uh, to get the kind of texture that you three uncovered a very different approach, which you all, you know, in the 1890s when Jacob Reese wrote How the Other Half Lives, it was possible to live in New York City and not know. And in a sense, it seemed as if this is what you found as well. We all live in the United States, and yet how much do we really know? So let's talk about what you found and, and uh, a little bit more about the substance of what happened when you got to these places. The fallows t seem to me to be telling us a story of tremendous um, innovation, creativity, connectedness, social solidarity on the ground in many communities that are dismissed in a line in national news stories as dying, decaying, deindustrialized. And uh, maybe I read it too optimistically, but. Do you want to speak to that? Sure, to start off, and, and what, what Hillary is saying is very much in, in parallel with what we found, and our timing was different. We started it again in the middle of 2013. We ended just you know, not long after the, the 2016 election, but the impression w w was the same. Let me just make one briefly one media point, and then, then mm -hmm. what we heard from the communities. I think something that has, actually, has actively distressed me in the past year and a half or so is when many news organizations have sent out reporters to out there or to the heartland after the 2016 election. The question they send them out to ask is, do you still like Trump? Mm -hmm. What do you think about Mueller? Do you, what do you think about Hillary? Was she crooked? Was the election rigged? <laughs> That's the least interesting thing you can ask anybody. As soon as you ask that question, you just, you're not going to learn anything at all. But if you ask what's happening in the town, what's happening in your lives, what's getting better or worse, it's a very different drama that comes up. And, and so, so essentially, our main point was over this, this multi-year period, every place we went had problems. Opioids is a, a terrible, terrible problem. Every place we went had lost jobs and they had the polarization economically of, of the area. But almost every place we, we went, people felt as if they were moving the needle in the right way. And again, I'll use the case of San Bernardino. I don't know if any of you have been there. I've, I've known it all my life. That is a really, really troubled city. It was in you know, bankruptcy for longer than any other city after the, the crash. It has terrible crime problems. But even there, young people and some of the, the, the older business establishment, they feel as if they are figuring out experimental approaches to education and to civic government and to getting people uh, engaged in, in voting. So basically, we felt as if in different ways that were specific to each town, something that worked in Greenville, South Carolina, has parallels to but is different from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, or Bend, Oregon, or Columbus, Mississippi. There was this sense of really active engagement of people saying, okay, here's an approach that works in Mississippi, and here's an approach that works in, in northern Minnesota, and here's an approach that works in Montana, and in different ways, all aware of the problems, they were felt as if they were in charge of moving more, more in a good direction than bad. It's fascinating that there is uh, so much manufacturing occurring in America. We're, we're accustomed to hearing about the decline of manufacturing, the uh, the loss of jobs, and uh, you know, this was obviously a big theme in the 2016 election that that our current president was really hammering. But you're telling a story of a, a lot of interesting uh, and innovative efforts to uh, create private and public partnerships that are rebuilding manufacturing in new ways. These people that make things. Deb, do you want to speak to that? One thing I'll speak to first is, is that um, the public-private partnerships, but in traditional big-scale manufacturing that really surprised us. 
we were in the Golden Triangle of Mississippi, mm -hmm. which is south of Oxford, Mississippi, but in north the northeast part. We went to this little town of Columbus for a completely different reason, and then discovered in, in this Columbus, three towns, Columbus, West Point, and Starkville in eastern Mississippi, there they were developing $5 billion of new heavy industry. Gone were the textile mills, gone was the blue jean factory, gone was the toilet seat factory, gone was the headstone makers because they lost the contract with the Department of Defense. And in their place came the Boeing helicopter. Airbus. Air, Airbus, sorry, I always confuse that one. Helicopters. Yokohama tire and rubber, new state-of-the-art uh, steel mi mill. And the people who lost those jobs in the little factories were being trained by East Mississippi Community College to in kind of prototype plant floor, floor, plant room floors for exactly the kinds of high-tech skills that they needed to have a chance to have a job in the in the new engineer in those new high tech companies, and what can you talk about the um, the South the Sioux Falls agro business? No, I'll just mention so, briefly. Yeah. What, one of the first things we thought in the first second or third day we were on the road in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. There's a place called Raven Industries. I don't know if any of you have heard of Raven. They make, among other things, they make all the balloons for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day parades. <laughs> so we got to see those like three months ahead of time. We were sworn to Top secrecy. Secret. You know, they were, oh, we couldn't reveal that it was going to be Snoopy. Snoopy. And so, but, but also they have, they have tractors there that are about as big as this stage. They're just huge. We took a picture of Deb standing next to one of these tractors that would you know, barely fit here. Yeah. These are GPS-guided tractors. Raven's specialty is all this geospatial information, and they've revolutionized the sustainability of agriculture because they can find the GPS coordinates of where one seed is and put one drop of fertilizer on that and then one drop of pesticide and water just that particular area. And this is you know, a big manufacturing uh, uh, you know, a project for Sioux Falls, and there were similar things like that, which the Kauffman Foundation in Kansas City has pointed out that overall, all the new jobs in the U.S. are created by companies that are in their first five years of life. Older companies have big employment bases, but on average, they shed as many jobs as they, they lose. You don't know about these new companies by definition, but there's lots of them. We saw them in Louisville, we saw them in Bend, we saw them in Fresno and elsewhere. Hillary, it was more of a mixed bag, your yeah. voices. Uh, yeah. You heard, uh, it seems to me, uh, from people on both sides of this story. You wanna... Definitely. Well, it's funny. I was thinking about some of the um, places yeah. you all write about um, are places where we took the bus. So mm -hmm. I was thinking about when we were in Memphis, we took the bus um, to park it for the day at a place called Crosstown Concourse, which is an amazing um, it was a former Sears factory, um, and it's now been transformed into a cross-functional workspace. They have apartments, they have a podcasting company, all these little tech startups, beautiful coffee bar, and it is this um, really, really amazing, vibrant um, place to go hang out and do some shopping and, and live or whatever. Um, but that doesn't mean that all the stories that we heard in Memphis reflected that um, culture or, or character. Um, especially as we started in St. Louis, um, right, I mean, liter literally they were, the city was like on edge waiting for a, a Ferguson-like verdict to come down um, in, in, a, um, in a police shooting case. And everybody was very on edge and pretty much every conversation revolved around race relations. Now that day our bus was parked next to an awesome barbecue place, you know, that was like in a very happening part of, um, of, of town. And, you know, we, we felt those juxtapositions some places, right? Um, our second stop was in Little Rock and we were actually, we took the bus to the Clinton Library, which is just out of, out of town. And we parked, and I said, nobody's going to come here. We're too far out of town. There's no foot traffic. No one's going to come talk to us. We're never going to find out what's happening in Little Rock. And 
we had people drive, um, A, that didn't happen. We had tons of people come. We had to set up extra tents every place we went to accommodate all the folks who came. And we had people drive that day more than two hours to come talk to us. We wanted to talk about uh, mental health, health care, lack of support. We had veterans come talk to us. Um, a lot of a lot of issues affecting family, health care, support, um, in, in 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 the sort of um, like hyper personal space, but then also uh, race relations was something that came up. Not everywhere, but in that first loop we did from St. Louis to Little Rock to Oxford to Memphis to Birmingham, it was the thing. Mm -hmm. And people being very frustrated, both between black and white, between inside the African American community, inside the white community. I mean, it, it was all over the place. And but there, what there was was a desire for people to figure out how to sit down together and talk and know each other. And that was, um, you know, something, especially in some of the forums that we put on. That in in some of these cities, they were built around. Uh, police and public communication and things like that was this feeling that if we all just knew each other better and understood our stories better and more personally we wouldn't all be shouting at each other it wouldn't feel so polarized so you know we heard a lot of good too and a lot of local pride and people who would never leave um, even with frustrations I'll just close on one story that I really like affected me. We were in Birmingham. Um, Birmingham was the one place where we were a little anxious because um, we, we could sort of monitor on social media how people were going to receive us. We did a lot of, um, we had security in mind when you're traveling and you know you're, you're, you have to keep these things um, in mind because you never know, you know, tensions rise, there can be protests, people, you just don't know. So. In Birmingham, there was a little chatter about, you know, HuffPost is coming to town. Oh, should we go down and mess with them or whatever? And we actually had amazing um, experience there with the bus in uh, a new public park that I think you, um, I can't remember which one of you wrote that like, even if there's not a river, there's yeah. a river walk. Yeah. And that is yeah. Railroad Park in yeah. Birmingham. It is yes. a beautiful, and everybody said, no one thought this park would work. This used to be gangs and bombed out buildings. Now it's this beautiful park um, along the, the old railroad tracks in Birmingham. And right towards the end of the day, we were there in the evening, a woman came in and she said, I, we, I walked up to talk to her, I said, hey, what brought you down? She said, oh, my friend told me I had to come here, but she couldn't come, but I'm here, what are you doing, let's talk. And I said, you know, are you, are you from here? I've been here my whole life. And she said, actually, my little sister was one of the girls killed in the Birmingham church bombing. And I, I said, are you, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Tell me your, you know, t tell me how has your family been? Like, what's happened? And, and she said, um, you know, she said, we would never leave. This is where our family is. I mean, then, of course, her name is Lisa McNair. We interviewed her. And then when the um, Roy Moore, Doug Jones um, special election was happening, and Doug Jones was victorious, obviously, he had been the prosecutor in that yeah. case. And we were able to reach out to Lisa. She's just become this, this person who we can go to in Birmingham, both to connect us to others, to understand what's happening down there politically, but also to, um, you know, to we just really got a sense of what bound her um, to that place, even though her history there is a really traumatic one. Um, the, I think the this was a theme that certainly seemed key in your mm -hmm project that is the local pride and the importance of people who through generations had a tremendous investment in their town or in their city and stayed and uh, that that becomes a foundation stone in some sense for the rebuilding you describe. I want to move from that to, to what seems to me a paradox mm -hmm. that you point out, which is that 
in building up from uh, towns and cities that have suffered in some, some terrible reversal, that pride is very helpful. And there were in red, conservative red anti-tax voters who voted themselves a tax increase to rebuild the downtowns of these cities. And yet, nationally, it's tremendously conservative voters. I wondered if you could speak to that. There are two illustrations we give of this in the book, one from Michigan, one from, from Kansas. So just before, in the summer before the election, we were in the city of Dodge City, Kansas, uh, which is near, all of you know, many of you may know, the Gunsmoke series. Uh, which is set in Dodge City. Um, I read in the paper yesterday that only recently had the Simpsons overtaken Gunsmoke for having the <laughs> most number of episodes in, in, in TV history. So Gunsmoke was you know, popular in the US back in the baby boomer era. It's still popular in Germany. So the streets of Dodge City are filled with German tourists, which is, is, is weird. But, but Dodge City is a, a fascinating place because it's Western Kansas is politically very conservative. It's a conservative part of a conservative state that voted heavily for Trump. I think Dodge City's county went about three for one for, for Trump. But at the same time, they were very proud that about 20 years ago, they passed a local permanent tax increase called the Why Not Dodge Initiative to use as a permanent infrastructure fund. And they show the swimming pools and the downtown public art and the stadium and all these things is from their permanent standing extra tax on, on the city. And also when we were there, Dodge City is ethnically quite interesting. The business leadership is majority Anglo. The town itself is probably slight majority Latino now with the meatpacking industry. And the school population is heavily Latino. But in the face of the budget cutbacks from the, the Kansas state government under Sam Brownback, the mainly white voters of Dodge City voted a bond issue for their mainly Latino school district to keep it going. And, and we heard from many white business people that, you know, this is our future. This is how the town mm -hmm. keeps going. And there's a similar episode we have from Holland, Michigan, which is the home mm -hmm. of the Betsy DeVos family and also very conservative. But their school district also now becoming more non-white. It's a very conservative Dutch white town traditionally now with a mainly um, mainly uh, Latino school district. And so they voted also a bond issue to keep their schools um, improving. And so there is, we don't attempt to explain this paradox, which will leave to the academics and to <laughs> others to, to look back in our era. But there certainly is, we just wanted to establish the paradox that when people say America is becoming polarized and bitter and selfish and it's just for me that does describe our national politics but it does not describe most of the local operation we saw and so finding some way to reconcile that contradiction is something we will all work on but but noticing the contradiction is something we, we wanted to do. Go ahead. And, and, and something that um, speaks to what we also saw especially in the south that the, the the issues of racism and racial history in uh, and how towns recognize that there is this huge issue right in front of them, the most important thing they're trying to deal with. And some of them are finding ways to directly deal with it. This is going back to Mississippi, Columbus, Mississippi, where um, it was a hospital town during the Civil War. Uh, they um, have cemeteries with mostly Confederate soldiers, but some Union soldiers as well. It's a black and white town. Um, the public school in that town, which is kind of a special school, it's called a governor's school, where kids from all over the state, the bayous, the deltas, the shacks and shanties, come to that public boarding school for a couple of years to learn math and science primarily. They also have a program whereby the kids um, who are all colors and everything go, go to the sem they do They do reconstructions and reenactments based on people they found, people, remains they found in the cemeteries during the era, and directly try to write a program and a play and a musical direct ab about the race, racial issues in the history of their town and confront it. 
and then present this performance in the town cemetery to all of the people in the town with the idea that you will come together and meet your neighbors and talk about these things that are so difficult to talk about there but is the absolute elephant in the room of that town. So it works there because it's like at the forefront of everyone's mind and the kids are trying to assess it and deal with it and it, it's, this has been going on for years now and the audience is building and it's not a solution but it's, it's a direction and it's a, a confrontation of what do you do with the problem? Well, I thought that was a wonderful story about the widening of understanding through the use of this history assignment. It helped that there were segregated cemeteries yeah. for, you know, to go to the African American cemetery to get one uh, set of experiences and another where these Confederate soldiers were buried. It was a brilliant thing, it seemed to me. And the diversity of the students you know, uh, makes, makes it work. Which brings me to a question that I want to ask before we move to the general discussion. And that is also about immigration. Uh, it seemed as if your story was quite optimistic about at the ground level where people in these communities, where people really got to know immigrant groups and there was an enormous amount of civic interchange among these groups, there were not these biases, this terrible prejudice and hostility, and then that these were communities that were working together. Um, and yet, you identify some of these very same places as very responsive to the Trump these were Trump voters who, uh, not to diverge into the national picture, but another paradox, it seems to me, of your story. Hillary, did you run into a similar? I think because we were so focused on individuals, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. two things. One is we did, we encountered a lot of young people who were DACA recipients who were anxious about their status mm -hmm. and then more broadly about their families. Um, and that was just a fact of being out there um, anywhere. There were some young people who came down to talk to us. I remember one young guy in, um, in Memphis actually was really concerned. It wasn't just when, you know, we did do, we did a sort of trip through the Southwest. Um, we got to Albuquerque, Tucson. We were in Odessa, Texas, um, and then Houston. One. I mean, one other stop that we made, which is a little bit of a tangential point, but mm -hmm. goes, goes to this. We, when we left Tucson, we were in Tucson on a Friday. And we had the weekend. So, um, and I was actually there for this part. We drove the bus down to a tiny, tiny town called Aravaca at, um, at the border. And there are about 600 people in Aravaca, um, many retirees who, and, and, ran, and a lot of ranchers. It's also a hot spot for sort of vigilante border justice. And the town itself is in conflict because the people who have moved to Aravaca, they're, um, I don't know, there were like five buildings in the whole town. Um, you know, they're artists, they're retired, they're um, just sort of there to be in warm weather and have a quiet life. The whole town has barbecues on Saturday, like that we were invited. They're like, you have to come, the whole town will be there. <laughs> um, but the other thing that unites the town is um, a really, really strong commitment to humanitarian work um, and going out, I mean, a great and ever greater risk to themselves to help people who have come across the border. These are folks that get door knocked at all hours of the night. Um, we spoke to a woman who, um, who ran, you know, like a an artisan shop in town with all kinds of knickknacks and and handcrafts and things inside, and she, you know, for the last like ten years had been someone would show up on her door, she'd get them in her car, keep them low, and get them drive them two hours to Tucson or wherever. Um, she could get them to get medical help and the kind of resources they needed, but now and we've did thinking about a difference on the bus, like we had border checks going to Aravaca. Like we had to stop and, and go through the security and all of that. And 
you know, but the town, which has not one but two nonprofit humanitarian organizations operating out of it, a town of 600 people, um, was just like not going to move. And we were there on a Saturday morning when there was a little farmer's market. The truck came into town, everybody said, that's like the head vigilante, you know, yeah. who's, yeah. he comes in to kind of like freak people out, let us know that he's, he's around. Um, but that was an amazing, that was one of those places where you say, I have to come back here, but you think, when am I going to get back to Aravaca? Like, it is far, far away from, from every place, but was just, I think, left an amazing impression um, on us. Another, there were two guys we met here, my husband's here with me, and he was there on the trip too, and he just like, we were reporting and he struck up a conversation with, um, with a man who had basically just like stopped in Aravaca and never left and had also picked up a hitchhiker who was a young Iraq war veteran. Do I have that right? Afghanistan veteran. Um, and they, and he had just taken them in, him in and they were just living together as roommates in Aravaca for six months, mm. supporting each other. He had lost his, mm. the older gentleman had lost his wife and had sort of gone out across the country mm. and just found his home here. And there was just this, you could feel the community. Like, even though there was, there weren't that many people. It was just an astounding place. It's really, it's very fascinating. And I feel even amid the, the uh, optimism troubling that the, uh, somehow the narrative that we listen to every day is one of national decline. And you're seeing a story about uh, a, a much more complex yeah. and vibrant story. I think um, it's time to move to our Q&A, and there are microphones uh, scattered about. So if you line up, um, we will uh, take questions in turn. Uh, if you can tell us who uh, your question is directed to, and I would ask that um, you really ask a question rather than deliver a uh, Jeremiah, which probably everybody in the room could do. Um, and um, to keep your question brief so that we can um, get to whomever would like to speak. So go ahead, sir. Uh, uh, Jimmy Depp, um, your book shows lots of positivity. But I want to mention another book, bestseller title is Strangers in Their Own Land. Author is uh, Ali Russell yeah. uh, Huckshell. So uh, she basically a few study in small towns in Louisiana and found people there feel they are, have been left behind. So they made lots of political choices that are hard to understand by us in bigger cities. So I want to know whether you run into situation like that and also, uh, Ms. Eric, uh, whether your bus tour uh, has shown something like that. Okay. The, the, so this is a book about Arlie Hochschild's book, Strangers in Their Own Land, about people, sort of what you could almost caricature as, as resentful Trump voters, and this is a, a lot of, uh, in Louisiana. When Deb and I lived in China, something we liked about living in China was the certainty that every contradictory truth you could say about China was true someplace in the country. Anything you could say it was good, bad, getting better, getting worse. Something, I mean, the U.S. is a big, complicated country with 300 plus million people. At any given time in America's history, there have been people moving ahead and people uh, falling behind. Uh, two facts that I think are, are relevant. Um, in the last, it was less than 100 years ago that most Americans were farmers. So within that amount of time, you know, all these livelihoods of people have been overturned. And uh, I won't even go into the other statistical fact I was going to give. But yes, there are people across every place we went, there were people losing ground, industries that were falling, and all the other problems that we know are the case. We came across many, uh, you know, direct instances of, of the opioid crisis, which is we thought was the most serious thing going on here. The news we wanted to convey actually has been, been balanced by some recent polls, or, or bolstered by some recent polls, saying that in the part of America they understand in its full complexity and dimensionality, people think most things, think on general it's getting better. They're aware of the tragedy. They're aware of the resentment. They're aware of things that haven't worked out as, as well as you know, through history, things have not worked out for everybody. But just as in 
Now, in any part of the world, there are a range of tragedies and successes. Yes, there, there is this, this range, but we're reporting on most people feeling as if the direction overall was positive. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. In the book, you uh, mentioned uh, William James' famous essay on the moral equivalent of war. And you said in the post-9-11 uh, area, the greatest uh, sin of, uh, of commission by the U.S. was the invasion of Iraq, and the greatest uh, sin of omission was a missed opportunity for uh, national development. But I would beg to deal with you. I would say that the only thing worse than the invasion of Iraq were the sanctions on Iraq that preceded, and we probably killed over a million people. And those sins of commissions have continued ever since then. Obama bombed more countries than Bush did. So why is uh, Americans so self-centered uh, that they don't give a damn how many uh, foreign nationals they uh, murder and maim? All they care about is their own selfish selves. So there's the occasion for a whole nother discussion on this. In the two years before the Iraq war, I spent a lot of my time in the Atlantic saying, don't do this. This is going to be, uh, this is, this is going to be a huge strategic error. Um, I understand the argument of the moral and human complexities of the sanctions that, that preceded that. My argument was that, so this is for another discussion offline or whatever. So every country is, in every big continental country, is essentially inward looking. China is that way, Russia is that way, Brazil is that way, India is that way, the United States is that way, Canada less so because it's next to the US. So the tension in the United States has been between the natural inward looking country, tendency of any large country and the forces trying to balance it out with a sense of the interests of the world. Yeah, but I guess we disagree. Yeah. Hi, first of all, I want to thank you for doing this book. I have a deep respect for um, the work that you engaged in these last um, several years. So thank Th you. Thank you. Um, I would also, uh, I guess, ask two questions. Yeah. The first would be, uh, my wife is actually from Western Kansas, um, a very small town, um, and I went into culture shock because I'm from Boston. Um, so I guess my, it, it was a very, very small town, and I said, where is, where is, uh, the main street? And she told me, you're standing on it. <laughs> so, uh, I guess my question about communities is, did you see a real difference in the smaller communities and the sensibilities of those communities versus some of the larger communities that you visited, like, you know, obviously Pittsburgh yeah. and, and some of the, obviously, California sites? Yeah. And I guess I, the second question would be, what's your take home in regard to this book? What do you want people to be able to then gather? You want to do, I'll do take the easy part. <laughs> <laughs> um, interestingly, from town to town, whether it was 1,400 people or 65,000 people or even 200,000 people, um, we heard a common language, which was, this town is the perfect size. It's big enough that there's a lot going on here. It's small enough that I can have an effect on things going on here. It, uh, and in the way it played out in Eastport, Maine, population 1,400, everybody had to do everything. We went to a play of the Glass Menagerie one night at the local theater. The ticket taker was also the newspaper editor. The stage manager was also the barista at the coffee shop, the nephrologist at the clinic, and she just opened a new kennel. <laughs> if, if, ever, if you weren't involved in three major things in that town, you were a complete slacker, so that's how it worked. Uh, in a bigger town of, um, I'm going to pick Sioux Falls, maybe, um, or Pittsburgh. Uh, what, what we noticed that was different there was that people more got into their silo of they were artists, or they were civic activists, or they were educators, but they still had that same sense that they could have an impact on that town because it was small enough that they could call somebody up or work in collaboration with somebody else or lean on another group to help them. They knew their neighbors, they were accountable to each other, and they would act that way. So it was, it was a, a different version of the same thing, but everybody was kind of moving in, in that sense. And, 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 <laughs> and thanks for your question about the, the, the take home, which I'll, I'll give as concisely as, as I can. Most people have heard from the media, especially in the past year and a half, the United States is uniquely divided, hostile, bitter, et cetera. Those things are true of national level politics. 
what we hope is the take home of this book is there is another half of the country or more than half and a contest for the future of the country is being waged right now between the poison that is dripping down at the top level and the sense of renewal and reinvention and experimentation that is going on in almost every place we went of people trying out things and, and just having an array of of possibilities and ideas and projects and connections. So we want mainly to, number one, to make people aware that this is going on because most people think it's only their own community. It must be hell every place else. And second, to think of ways in which being aware of that can add to its leverage and its potential so that when people look back on this era of history, I'll say this struggle was going on and the forces of renewal prevailed. That's what we want to convey. I wanted to comment, I'm sorry, I wanted to comment a little bit on a slip that you made when you talked about Columbus, Ohio, when you said it's a Midwestern city, not a national city. And I wanted yeah. to use that as an example of you, both of you, rep oh, you represent national news organizations who are definitely yeah. East Coast uh, news organizations. So could you comment yeah. on the divide yes. uh, between how stories got told yeah. because national news organizations do not have yeah. uh, interior uh, reporter re bureaus and have your experiences caused any of that to change? Well, so this is also, uh, that's a wonderful question yeah. because it dovetails partly with yeah. the story that the fellows tell about these uh, metropolitan news outlets and what's happened in yeah. these various yeah. places. and. Uh, also, I think it's very relevant to Hillary's project. So go ahead. So, so since I was the one who said that, I was deliberately shortening to two <laughs> sentences, or to two seconds, what is a 10-page part of the book, where I talk about how in Columbus in particular, it's a huge city. And it's, it says, you know, we're the number three fashion center in the world after, uh, after in the U.S., after New York and Los Angeles, and all the other ways in which Columbus is this really consequential thing. So I talk about the way a city as big as Columbus is treated as this regional place. And there's a sort of side drama. The leaders of Columbus would love you not to have to say Ohio just as with Pittsburgh or Seattle or Los Angeles, but that can't happen because there's too many other Columbuses. There's one in Georgia, there's one in Mississippi. But so in the book, we address exactly the point you're making. It was a compression of 10 pages to two seconds that, that had me say that. And what I meant was it's an illustration of a city that the national media only go to when there's a shooting or a football game or the Ohio elections. You know, it's used as a background, it's used as a background grid for nationally conceived stories. And so revitalizing local journalism is another whole hobby horse, which I will not give you now, but it's, it's a great, it's something that has to happen. I think for us, um, we were very aware that uh, we had to be really careful doing this project because we could only be in each location for a day or day and a half. And it was, how do we avoid that being all we do? So last summer, we did um, a lot of research on every media outlet that was available in each place we were going. So that was TV stations, newspapers, um, independent digital startups, anything. And we sort of looked at the list and thought, who would be interesting and benefit from working with HuffPost, right? We have a huge distribution platform um, on the internet and we had some money to put into our reporting. So we really looked strategically for a mix of, we had some Fox TV affiliates who were our partners. We had nonprofit one-man band, um, Georgia Health News, one guy doing investigative reporting on health issues in Georgia. In St. Louis, we partnered um, uh, with the uh, historically black newspaper there that's a, an amazing institution in, in St. Louis. Um, that, and, and with all of these, I wouldn't say all, some we were closer partners with than others. We worked in different ways. Um, we worked with the newspaper in Charleston um, and with their amazing opioid uh, investigative reporter um, there on a, on a big project as well. Um, it was really determined by the local news partner what we took on with them. 
And getting their buy-in on the whole concept of the bus tour was critical to our success. I mean, in, in we went to Detroit, but we actually partnered with the Arab American News in Dearborn. And we were their front page story. <laughs> you know, the bus was plastered everywhere, and we did an amazing event with them. And um, a lot of those relationships are continuing. So for us, you know, I think, I, do I wish we had millions of dollars of investments and I can create regional bureaus across the country? Absolutely. With, without that, um, we created relationships across the country with local news outlets that um, are ongoing. And, you know, we can also tap them. I mean, this, was, this is really critical going into midterms, especially politics is huge for us, being able to have friends on the ground who are deeply knowledgeable that we created trust with, um, I think was as much a part of the project as collecting the voices. Go ahead, Deb. Um, when we when we were we traveled in different ways, um, and it, just like we didn't go in an exec jet, I just want to paint a little picture of how we went into these towns. Um, we have a little propeller plane. We landed at the tiny airports where there were lots of little propeller planes, crop dusters, you know, people's Sunday afternoon planes, whatever they were. And we went into town in the back of a pickup truck and found a Motel 6 to stay in. Um, and it was just us. So I, I would say we went in with a very light foot and mm -hmm. low profile. Um, we went like, in with a high profile. Yeah. <laughs> so, as high a profile as possible. <laughs> so it, it was different, but interesting that we found the same yeah. kinds of stories mm -hmm. and we found the same things of, of tell me your story. People would, people would just talk. People love to talk about themselves and, and they wanted to and would say things. And quickly, I think, if you had a, a microphone in front of them, they would forget that. We yeah. usually didn't have microphones. We were just taking notes. And I, I'm not a major news outlet person. I'm, I'm Jim's wife <laughs> and learned this trade as I went along too. So I think that kind of, um, I softened him, his appearance in some way. Not that, it, what am I trying to say? You know <laughs> I'm from, the, I'm from people Ohio. People like me better when I'm with them. <laughs> I'm from a small town of 10,000 people in northern Ohio, north of Columbus. And so it was, I just felt, I think we both felt very comfortable going in quietly to towns and like people didn't notice us. Well, the only time we were noticed is we interviewed the editor of the Dodge City Daily Globe and the next day there was a banner headline yeah, the Dodge right. City Daily Globe, Atlantic comes to DC. And then and DC <laughs> was Dodge City well, for them. It was amazing. <laughs> we, it was really, especially in some of, we went to Livingston, Montana and that was, that is a conservative town. And they were, there are no HuffPost readers, maybe two in like Livingston. There are also a number of writers who live in that community. Before you got there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I, that's a whole other story. But um, we did make we did win some readers out on the road. Um, but you know, the people sort of the bus. The big debate in Livingston was where to park the bus because there were locally there were two big locations in front of the bookstore or in front of the civic center. That's there's just a town square. It's got two things on it, right? It was which one do you park in front of? Um, but people overcame their skepticism of us, you know, once they realized that we were there, you know, for, for an authentic reason, but we were the big news. It was like a little more controversial in Livingston and some other places, it, people were flattered. You know, it was like, we can't believe you're, no one ever comes here. You're here, thank you for coming. But you, it seemed to me the fallacy also showed that the use of new digital technology, the new information technology, at the local level, in the schools that you visited, Deb, where the kids have iPads and they have access to this extraordinary information, is really changing things on the ground. The, the experimentation going on in the schools that we visited was, was really extraordinary. I had no idea. We'd usually say, what's an interesting school we could go to in this town? Sometimes there was one school, so you went to that school. Other times you could spend two weeks going to these schools. The, it, and again, it was always very locally based. Winters, California, a tiny town in, in the North Central Valley, agricultural town. Half the kids in that school were 
learning high-tech agriculture because mm -hmm. the town was trying to help these kids grow and understand and continue on with their agriculture tradition, not just history and economics of how to run a business in agriculture, but the micro farming, learning to maintain and use and maintain these high tech, um, the machinery that's going on in the, there. And place by place, you had agriculture in California, you had in the element, A.J. Wittenberg Elementary School of Engineering in Greenville, South Carolina, no kidding, Elementary School of Engineering, pre-K <coughs> through fourth grade in Greenville, South Carolina, where there was a collaboration of, <coughs> of Michelin, G GE, and BMW, high-tech industries, going into these schools to help infuse this sense in these little bitty kids that they could grow up and be the employees of of these companies and be prepared for it in the worst coming from the, the worst. The anyway. proximity of universities to these communities also uh, really seemed to make a difference in, in the story you were telling, Jim. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I'm in tears. I, I'm from a small town. I've biked across the country and I've been to a lot of places that you all have been. Um, I have a question. Um, David Brooks wrote an article, A Generation Emerging from the Wreckage, when he visited college students around the country and really thinking about millennials. And he said the problem is they're having this incredible local experience of heroes doing incredible things, but they're not connecting it to the national institutional levels. Um, and and you're, you all talk today really connecting what's happening across the country and not in these major cities or major power universities. So I wonder what, what you would say are practical ways of connecting um, people uh, in, in this huge gap you see, um, and, and particularly as we're trying to move from you've, what you've described as the poison of the national stage to this very creative, um, fertile, community-oriented um, journey you've taken? So this is a fascinating question that we actually plan to spend the next stage of our life trying to deal with and, and connecting people around the country. My, my basic division here is there are things that you can control. And that's things like making sure you vote and making sure your neighbors vote and participating in national politics that way and also being involved locally in all the ways we're, we're talking about. There are things you can't control or foresee, which is exactly when this is going to take fire and connect nationally. I'll use just two illustrations. I worked for Jimmy Carter long ago when he was a candidate and then in the White House. Nobody in 1973 would have seen Jimmy Carter as, as the President of the United States three, three years later. It required a certain national mood and configuration for which he ended up being the voice at that time. So with Barack Obama. Nobody in 2002, 2003 thought he was going to be the President after George W. Bush. But there were, the combination of his personality and those times meant that this, something was happening for which he could be the, the, uh, you know, the, the vehicle or, or the symbol. I think there will come a time like that again, where in a way that nobody can foresee right now, there will be a person whose life story and whose ability to give voice to other people's story will connect to what people are looking for and finding examples of across the country. And so while we cannot foresee that or, or make it happen, the only thing we can do is, is promote as much as possible these local area uh, improvements. And so like the, all the different reform groups of the early 20th century, I think that, that's the role we're in historically. We can't know exactly where it's going to lead, but we prepare so that we're ready when, when it happens. Uh, I think if we have very short answers, we might be able to get everybody in. So short question, short answer. Yeah. Okay. Short, short question, maybe. Um, you all speak about uh, the wonderfulness and importance of listening to the people uh, all across the country. Could you comment on the, the national news perception that because of social media or divisiveness, people can't in turn listen to each other? They love being listened to, but they can't listen to each other. That's a wonderful question. Anybody? Hillary? 
You heard a lot of voices. <laughs> you know, I didn't have so much of an impression that people couldn't listen to each other. Um, I, I mean, because we, we were also inside of these communities. What really what we saw happen, we would set up these tents and people would have to wait because we always had a waiting line to, for the official interview period that was recorded. And people started interviewing each other um, and making their own connections. And I think, you know, it, there really is a thing about physical space, right? It's like you can telecommute and you can be on Google Hangouts for work, but I still like to go to an office and I really prefer when my staff is nearby and I can talk to them in person. And I can't let go of the importance of people sharing space. And I, I think sometimes the news, because so much of it occupies this space out here, too, it just adds to this the layers of disconnection that are sort of part of how we're living right now. I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but I, I feel I really felt, and you're such an optimist. Like I feel so optimistic after this conversation, where you know, really, we did don't hear leave the room. A, we heard a lot of really sad horrible, just like devastating stories of, yeah. of personal challenges people were facing, but still the overall um, feeling out of the tour was one that, I mean, I really, A, it was a privilege to be able to do that work. I really felt like we were creating something for the communities and that really was a space to meet. I guess um, uh, maybe I, then I should refer to the fallows. When you, the first day of a meeting in a town, you got together with the editor, the mayor, the, you know, the big, and I don't know, was it in a room forum where you could observe them talking to each other? Sometimes we did that. Usually we just one, went one by one by one to interview them, say, you know, tell me the story of the t your town, what's interesting here. The, the, I guess the, the way I'd answer your question is, 20 years ago, I wrote a book called Breaking the News about sort of the beginning of some of these patterns. But long, long ago, Walter Lippmann wrote a public opinion, and I think 1914, 1915, around that time, about how the difficulty of when people can still deal directly, as, as Hillary's talking about, our ex experience was they could still listen, they could still compromise, and how we deal with the inevitability that at national scale that is impossible, and it's become this sort of phantasmagorical nightmare now. So I think. It, that conscious effort to thinking about how we can bridge this divide, I'll just say that, that that's part of the next step too. I think we only have time for one more here. This is here. a pretty short question, but it's on point to the media question. How is the health of local media? Are people still willing to pay subscriptions yeah. and have a local newspaper? Are there new funding models? Are there new journalists? We found anomalous successes of thriving local media. Two illustrations, the, the um, seven days in Burlington, Vermont, which has become a sort of formal alt-weekly that's now a financially healthy print-based um, state newspaper. And a number of places, including the, the Erie Reader in, in Erie, Pennsylvania, again, a, a weekly that is sort of the, the voice of that, that community. But generally, the pressures on journalism in general are most intense on local journalism. This is today's technologically benefited organizations like Google and Facebook and Twitter, and today's plutocrats and philanthropists need to pay attention to this. For what would be to them a trivial amount of money, they could set up endowments. You know, the National Endowment for the Arts, but for local journalists, or just in, in uh, programs. Google is doing some of this, but this is, this has to happen, and they're the ones who have the money to, to help underwrite it. It seems as if, uh, you know, this is, it's a wonderful to be having this conversation at the Kennedy Library because part of uh, President Kennedy's uh, vision, of course, of the nation was that it was the role of the president to uh, ensure that we weren't simply a collection of localities, but that we were a nation united by a set of values and opportunities. And the idea is to ensure that no matter where you live in the country, you have access to uh, those opportunities. And uh, so bridging the two sides of this story uh, really is a tremendous challenge, uh, particularly, it seems to me, at this moment in our history. So I think on that note, we have to end. Thank you very much for your questions. And
for coming tonight. Thank you to our guests.